I was just having a little discussion with Harley about the, another resource for church history and one that I take advantage of all the time are podcasts. My, some of you may also listen to podcasts of various kinds. Over the 18 years, especially the last 8 or 10 years, especially that I drove down to Odessa every weekend, I had you know, two and a half hours each way to either just you know, try to stay awake while on the road or listen to something while I'm driving. And so I listen to a lot of technology podcasts, but then I also listen to a lot of church history podcasts. And uh, two in particular that I mentioned to Harley that I've continued to enjoy is uh, one called Five Minutes in Church History. Each podcast, just once a week, uh, is about four to five minutes long. It always just takes one specific thing or person or event and covers it. The only exception to that is last November, I believe it was, he made a trip to Wittenberg, Germany. And so he did a podcast every day while he was there about something having to do with Martin Luther, which I also found very fascinating came to appreciate him a great deal more than I did before because uh, on several of those podcasts he talked about Martin Luther's wife you know she was a former nun he had actually helped her and 11 other nuns escape from the nunnery that was just outside of Wittenberg they escaped in empty uh, fish barrels they would bring in pickled herring for the nuns to eat and when the barrels were empty after they had enough empty barrels they had a local merchant that would come pick up the barrels and bring them out they hid the nuns in the barrels sort of uh, you know uh, what was the trilogy that was just out uh, yeah in the hobbit you know how they got out of the elf, elven uh, clutches into the river with their barrel but uh, that's how they got the uh, the uh, twelve nuns out and, and then Luther went to work helped most of them find husbands. I think maybe like uh, four of them went home to their families. Seven, he actually helped them find husbands. And he had one left over. And he said, I, I, I had nothing else I could do with her, so I married her. <laughs> well, that, that was sort of him being a little tongue-in-cheek because they had uh, a great marriage, a long marriage, had uh, several children biologically and adopted a number more. And uh, by all accounts, as this man in Five Minutes in Church History says, uh, she was as much of a scholar of the Scriptures as he was. Because that's another thing that happened with the Reformation is women were, in many aspects, raised up onto a more nearly level, level with men, which was not the case in either the Eastern Orthodox Church or in the, the Western Catholic Church at that time. Uh, they were they were more prominent. They were allowed to get an education, and in many ways, I think he always just referred to her as Katie. Her name was Catherine, Katerina. Uh, he always called her Katie, and uh, she she knew the scriptures as well as he did. And I think even a few writings from her still exist today as well. But anyway, that's five minutes in church history. And uh, then there's another one that's a longer one. Usually it ran about 14 or 15 minutes called The History of the Christian Church by a man by the name of Ralston, R-A-L-S-T-O-N. Uh, and if you do get them through iTunes, you can go back and find the back catalog, you know, of the ones that was given by him. He has about three years worth of them. But recently he just switched over and started doing them all over again, all in Spanish. And so that would be particularly of interest to Harley and others that, uh, back where he goes, perhaps. But it's called The History of the Christian Church by Ralston, R-A-L-S-T-O-N. But, you know, if you go into iTunes and podcasts and search for that, that's, that's what will come up first. And I, I found both of those particularly interesting. Then there was one a few years ago that ran for, uh, must have run for almost four years, on uh, the Roman Empire. Now at first that doesn't sound like that had anything to do with Christianity, but uh, when he gets down to the part along about, you know, 4 B.C. and forward, it has everything to do with Christianity. And I really enjoyed listening to uh, that series of podcasts on, uh, you know, the history of Rome. I think that's, that's what it was called, the history of Rome.
And then after he finished the history of Rome, he started a new series on revolutions, he called it. And I listened to a number of those as well. He, for example, he talked about the French Revolution, which was an atheist revolution. It was an attempt to overthrow the power of uh, not just the king in France, but also the power of the church in France and replace it with an atheistic government, which it did for a while. He had a whole series on the revolution in the French Revolution. He had a whole series on the English Revolution that took place in the early 1600s and involved King James's son, King Charles. James dies, his son Charles becomes king. He ends up, uh, you know, so much conflict between him and, and the Protestants, but not over church matters, but over political matters. Uh, and then his son, Charles II, is actually, well, I guess Charles himself is actually executed by the Protestants. Not a pretty thing, but anyway, he has this whole, I don't remember how many, 25, 30 podcasts just on the English Revolution. And of course, wound all in that is uh, Christianity for good and for bad. So uh, it's just another way, especially if any of you in, find yourself ended up having to make long trips somewhere regularly that uh, it's one way to expose yourself to more learning, understanding, and, and development in these areas is through podcast instead of just uh, listening to music, which there's nothing wrong with that either, or trying to find a ball game on the radio if you're into that kind of thing. Podcasts have been my, uh, my thing. All right, now let's turn back to this second of the sacraments, and maybe this is a good time to talk more about this whole concept of sacrament even before we talk about the Lord's Supper. We've already defined sacrament as a Christian writer practice that uh, originated with Christ and or the apostles and is seen either as a way that God's grace or Christ's grace is dispensed to His people through that practice or is symbolic or representative of his grace being dispensed to us. So I guess we're sort of on the fence on that. We would say about baptism, this is actually in a sense where His grace is dispensed because that's a moment we understand that our sins are forgiven. We enter into Christ. We leave the kingdom of darkness, go into the kingdom of light. And so we would, in a very real sense, say His grace is dispensed to us at baptism. But then when we look at Lord's Supper, we'd say, hmm, that's probably more symbolic. It's representative of the body and blood of Christ, and we're to do this as a memorial, and so we don't put nearly as much emphasis on the grace as, for example, they do in the Eastern Church or in the Catholic Church or even in the Methodist Church, because Methodism is still very close in some ways to the Anglican Church in, in, in its doctrinal practices or doctrinal belief system. So we're, we're sort of on both sides of the street, but there are some other sacraments. At the very end of the notes, uh, for those of you who have my notes, I have a little section there called All the Sacraments. And at the Council of Florence, which was in the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, in Florence, Italy, in 1438 to 1445, there was a Council of Florence and the Western Church affirmed that which was already the practice in the church, that there, was, that there are seven sacraments, not just two, but seven. And, uh, and as some have jokingly said, but it probably is true, that they viewed these sacraments as, being, as guiding the Christian from the womb to the tomb. <laughs> Starting, of course, with baptism because they baptized infants. And then there was communion. Is when, uh, not just the first time, but all the times after that, that you then take the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. And, of course, in the Catholic Church, at least the modern Catholic Church as we know it, uh, that is administered as it has been for at least 1,500 years by the priest. And I think the modern church, they only, it's only the bread, isn't it? And they, they, this this growing, ever growing doctrine still in the Catholic Church about the, the the preciousness of the blood of Christ eventually led the church to stop dispensing the the cup, as a separate uh, part of the Eucharist. It's usually only the bread now, as each 
a participant comes forward, the priest takes it and puts the bread on their tongue, and then the next person the next, but not the cup. In some rare cases, a cup is still uh, administered, but um, I understand mostly not. But that's communion. Then there's confirmation. This is when a child reaches a point in their life that it's felt like by the church and by the parents and the child that they have a faith of their own. Then their faith is confirmed. It's sort of like doing what we think we do at baptism. You know, they were baptized when they were just a few days, weeks, or months old. But now at age 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, they, they go through confirmation. And now they, they confess a faith of their own. And they now, it's not just their parents doing it, but they themselves confess that faith. And they themselves commit to being faithful members of the body of Christ and so forth. So that's confirmation. It's a sacrament in, in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, then there's confession, because we usually think of it only in the more, in what seems to us a very negative aspect of it, when a person goes into the little confessional, and the priest is on one side of the uh, wall, and they're on the other side, and they confess their sins, and then the priest uh, grants forgiveness of their sins, and we find that pretty... Uh, I, I can't think of the right word. I, I, I want to be careful what word I use. I don't want to overstate it or understate it. But it, do, it doesn't seem appropriate. It doesn't seem scriptural. It doesn't seem uh, right. And, and yet, again, it's, it has a long history of how it got to that point. But that's confession. Anyway, that's the confessional. And it's a sacrament. It's where God's grace, obviously, and their way of thinking, would be dispensed to the uh, confessing person because they're receiving forgiveness. See, in the early church, by the, in the 300s, a big raging controversy in the church in the, in the 3rd century and the 4th century is if a person is baptized upon confession of faith and then they sin afterwards, is there no more forgiveness of sins? Is there no more way for them to be forgiven? Do they have to live a perfect life after baptism? And for a while, that was a belief in the church by many that... Uh, that once you became a believer and was baptized as an adult, that you had to pretty much live a sinless life because there was no, no other way to have your sins forgiven after that. And, the red Hebrews without reading it the yeah, and so gradually the church developed the confessional as a way to solve that problem. You see? Yeah. And, and so some, like Constantine, we always think of him as a Christian emperor, he was baptized on his deathbed because he just did not feel like, did not believe that he would be able to live a sinless life after his baptism. So he waited and, and gambled that he would have a, the chance to get a priest there and baptize him before he actually passed away <laughs> because he, he, he felt like there would be no more forgiveness after that if he should sin again. So he waited to his very deathbed to be baptized. Well, gradually the church developed this confessional system to, to answer that problem. We, we, we follow a slightly different path, but the end result is the same. We look at 1 John chapter 1 uh, and 2, and we talk about, you know, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we see that's talking about those after baptism. It's us. We, we, just don't we don't just intercede a priest in between us and God. We, we just take it straight to God in prayer. And uh, if we look at James 5, again, we're sort of stitching some things together, aren't we, to try to get a cohesive doctrine here. We look at James 5, if we confess our sins one to another, He's faithful and just, for, you know. And uh, so we're also trying to solve the problem. We're trying to find a, a doctrine that seems to be consistent with the New Testament. Realize that the Roman church wasn't limited to saying we want to find a doctrine consistent only with the New Testament. They wanted a doctrine that was consistent with the New Testament, with the teachings of the church fathers, and with what the leaders of the church uphold. So they, that, made a, that gave them a little more flexibility in what they ended up with.
because they didn't have to just stick just to the New Testament, which we've tried to commit ourselves to doing. Yes, Stephen? So, do you, uh, what would you say to those people who, because I met a few guys in prison, we call them the Colorado Five. Okay. And uh, they believe that they could no longer sin. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, what is the, do you know the name of that particular doctrine? What? I don't. <laughs> That's the name of the doctor, maybe. No. I was just wondering. No, I was just wondering because I, I think it's, well, this is something I rack my brain around because of First John chapter chapter three talks about the person who goes on, who continues to practice in sin right. mm -hmm. does not have the spirit of God in him, and it does it does say the word if, which we could go in the Greek and say. If anyone does sin, we have a mediator, but it's not right. like if anyone does. It means if anyone sins, so there's that big if. Now, I've right. never met anyone that has not sinned. I mean, I, even first, if you claim. In claim. First John chapter 1, verse. All have sinned. Eight. Yeah. Uh, anyone who says he has not they sinned. Not sinned the life, the no. truth is not but after, we're talking about after mm -hmm. Christ. No. That's what I'm saying. After Christ. Well, yeah. I can see how that thinking would develop. Now, it, as it would pass down through several people, the people further down the stream of being taught by others might not understand all the deep background to how they ended up with that thinking. You know, even for us, we think about that if we continue in the light, if we continue to be committed to following Christ and living according to His will, even as we sin, that doesn't automatically knock us off the road or bump us out of a right you know, an eternal right relationship with God. Uh, you know, and yet there are others who think that, that every time they uh, are tempted in a moment, they, they slip up and say something they shouldn't have said to somebody else, that at that moment they're lost eternally unless they uh, immediately confess that or as soon as they become aware of it, confess it and ask forgiveness in their back. So they're constantly jumping off and on the road to heaven yeah. in, in that way of thinking. And, uh, and yet, it's not my conviction that that's what the Scriptures are actually teaching about how our relationship in Christ with God works. That instead, that, that even as we fall short, but as we are committed to this pathway, and we, uh, you know, as we become aware of our failings, we confess those, that, that, that we still are on the road uh, the entire time. And, and that, on the one hand, one extreme you can end up with is one of the five points of, of Calvinism. No, you know, no. impossibility of apostasy. Yeah. Uh, on the other is, is this other idea that, that you're just constantly in, in relationship, out of relationship. In rela and, and that may be happening a dozen times a, a, every day. Yeah. And, I, you know, and so I'm sort of in some middle ground. And I think... Hopefully, the majority of folks in in the restoration movement pretty much thinks that same way, and that that doesn't make it right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what most folks I know in the restoration churches think along that line too. Yeah. But uh, and and so maybe they were influenced originally. The Colorado Five were influenced by someone who said, "Well, look, you're not constantly falling in and out of." a relationship with God when you're really committed to Christ and He's your Lord and you're trying to serve Him with all of your heart even when there are slip-ups and failings and so forth that take place that doesn't God doesn't in that instance said okay strike him back off the list mm -hmm. until I hear from him in prayer when he confesses his sin and then I've erased that strike out and put his name back on the roll again yeah. uh, you know so I can see how someone might not necessarily think, all, think that all the way through I suppose there are some that say, well, I can't sin. Oh, yeah. When I think really it's we, we, we don't sin at a level that, that, that you know, destroys our eternal salvation. Yeah. So. I got you. You don't, you don't have the name of a particular doctor then? Uh, no, one that comes to mind, but I, you you'd probably wouldn't be able to find it anywhere. It would be called perfectionism. There we go. And... Uh, We'll make, it, we'll make it up. Yeah, we'll make it up. We'll, that, that's a pretty good one. We don't think of that. Either. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, you know, you know what Peter says, it's five, it's two, one, 
that's chapter 5, 1 through like 8. And he says, if you do these things in increasing measure, measure, mm -hmm. then you will never fall. Mm -hmm. Somewhere else he says, you'll never stumble. Mm -hmm. One could take that and just magnify it and say, I'll never fall. I'll never stumble. Therefore, I, I can actually never sin again. Mm -hmm. And... Therefore, I'm going to be perfect. You know, I'm like, right. I'm supposed to, there is this thing where I can be perfect and sinless when actually, obviously, perfect means mm -hmm. complete, mature, and there's a difference between missing the mark, you know, sin, but then practicing right. sinning. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. Well, and th this is where, uh, you know, this is a sense in which confession is the dispensing of God's grace. Because that's when forgiveness takes place too. And that is God's grace at work. And you can't really ever prove, only illustrate something by an example. But since the scriptures constantly talk about our relationship with God as being very similar to a father's re uh, relationship to his children. My children didn't stop being my children when they disobeyed me. Right. They didn't even stop being my children when they went into rebellion against me. And I've had that happen with my children. Not all of them, but one. And, uh, but she's still my child. I shouldn't have said which one it was. <laughs> I've only got one daughter. Uh, but I, I don't love her any less. She's no less my child. She is not in a full, whole, right relationship with me right now. And that, that example that is, a, that is appealed to numerous times in the Scriptures, I think is for a purpose to tell us that in some way reflects our relationship with God too. Yeah. Now, can, can it reach a point where uh, she is not my child? Well, in a sense, yes. But in another sense, no. That could never happen. She would never not be my child. But could it reach a point where by her choice, not mine, right, right. but by her choice, mm -hmm. she cuts herself off from the blessings that come from being my child? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that's really what happens with people in, having entered into a relationship with, with God through Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's what they can then choose to end up doing too. Right. So, so with, with, with that illustration, um, and another way... You're actually taking the time to build it all the way out. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, um, for example, uh, not all, but some under the Baptist mm -hmm. uh, brand, would you say that? They, um, they would say, they would take Romans and say, uh, but there's nothing that can separate us from the love mm -hmm. of God, right? right. So when, when Paul later on says you can miss the grace of God, right? Mm -hmm. Corinthians, you are the church of God, but if you do not repent, you will not inherit the kingdom mm -hmm. of God, right? right? And so, they'll, they, I found that they take that, um, I'm a father, you know, and my son will never stop being my son, my daughter will never stop being my daughter, and so therefore, uh, nothing can separate me mm -hmm. from my salvation. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of take that and just kind of, uh, they, don't, they don't properly you know, put the scripture right. in this context. Which, when we, back to uh, Cole, it was Cole that spoke on Monday about Calvin, wasn't it? And uh, his, the, his uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion and so forth. He was trying to solve a problem. He was looking at what the church had done. By the church, I mean the Roman church. And how they had interpreted the, not only the, the power and nature of God, but also our relationship with Him. And said, that, I don't see that in the scriptures. And we would think maybe he went too far the other way. And when he talks about the, you know, the limited atonement, the impossibility of apostrophe and perseverance of the saints and so forth. And yet, we're all trying to strike the balance between these different things. You know, trying to find what seems, as near as we can understand it, this, what the scriptures are actually teaching on this. And so, I would really urge us all to always be rather kind and long-suffering to, toward those that maybe end up in a slightly different place or aren't quite as far along in their thinking as we feel like we are on this subject. Uh, I'm not sure that that necessarily 
puts them either into or out of a right relationship with God if they've got it all just right on all, uh, every, you know, every dot uh, on the I and every cross on the T. But still, going back then to the sacraments, again, the church was working with problems and trying to solve based on what they understood the scriptures taught and the early church fathers in the case of the western and eastern church both. So they end up with confirmation and confession. And then marriage. Again, for those of us who've had the blessing of uh, being married, along with all the challenges that have come along with that, uh, for many of us I think we would say this is a place where God has administered His grace in our life. It's been a blessing to to have that. My wife and I will celebrate our 51st wedding anniversary this year. It's a blessing that we've been able to make it that far. But, and I realize not all have been blessed with that. Uh, either never entered into marriage or their marriage uh, dissolved for whatever reason. But uh, still, we can see how the church saw that as a, as a place where God's grace touched uh, each human heart and each human life. Ordination, that's an interesting one because the church sees ordination, that is, those who are appointed to ministry. As priesthood or ministers or deacons or evangelists, and believe it or not, the Roman church actually has all of those, not just priests. They have ministers, they have deacons, they have evangelists, uh, deaconesses, and uh, several others as well that are ordained, appointed to uh, you know, service in the church in some of those ways. And they interpreted, they saw those appointments as a place and time where God is pouring out His grace on that person to allow them to serve in that way. And I think that's a beautiful picture. Uh, whether it needs to become one of the sacraments of, of the church or not, uh, I'm not arguing one way or the other. I'm just saying that is what was recognized as one of the sacraments. In the last rites, as they're often referred to today, uh, that was not an, the term they initially used for that. That's a rather late expression for that time when a person is, is dying, but they want to be right with God. They have been a part of the body of Christ in the past. Maybe they've abandoned the church, walked away from the church, out of a right relationship with God. But on their deathbed or near death, they said, I don't want to die like this. I don't want to go to face God lost. And so they confess their sins and the, the minister, or in the case of the church, the priest many times uh, absolves them of their sins. It's something a little different than just confession. It's deathbed confession. And uh, in some cases it, it was even people who had never been baptized even. It's people who had never been a part of the body of Christ before. Never enjoyed any of the other sacraments. And yet, at, at their death, they're confessing, uh, want, wanting to be right with God. And in many cases, in, in centuries past especially, uh, the priests usually carried on their person the symbols of the Eucharist with them. And so if they suddenly were called upon to administer the last rites, there's that word rites again, last practice for this person, they confess their sins, want to be right with God. They may have uh, something they can sprinkle a little water on them to count as baptism. They probably will even have uh, the bread with them to administer the Eucharist to them, hopefully before they die. And again, that may seem to all be totally foreign to us on one hand, and yet on the other hand, I see what they were trying to do. I see what they were trying to communicate in that. A person in a right relationship with God at least the, the desire was that this person be in a right relationship with God before they pass from this life into eternity. Right. And along those lines, um, you know, the, the, um, the pushback, right, against, mm -hmm. against baptism is the thief on the cross, right? Yeah. Now, we understand the, the chronological, the church had been established yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is on the cross, he's living, so he has all power and authority, obviously, to forgive someone's That's sins, right. just like he would do um, in his ministry. And you got the, the two thieves on the cross, and one says this, the other says that. Um, and then we would say to the person who says baptism is not needed, um, 
yeah, that's because the church is not established right. yet, right? After that, now through this way, uh, remission of sin, right, is now granted to a person based on that according to the scripture. But what just blows my mind about the grace of God is um, this thief, he was a thief. He, he was a criminal and probably lived a life of crimes, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And it's not like you're forgiven, hey, but uh, you're going to get off this cross and live like 10 more days to see if you remain faithful when you were my mm -hmm. disciple. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Because that just it just blows me away when I think about the grace and the goodness of the Lord because us on this side of now the order of salvation, um, we would probably be very uncertain if uh, someone lived a life, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and rejected Jesus, rejected Jesus, rejected Jesus, then found themselves on their deathbed, you know what I mean? Yes. And like, all right, hey, I knew I, I heard the way to get saved or get my sins forgiven, and, you know, we would kind of kind of question Right, and even if they were baptized right then, we would, we would maybe kind of be like, you know what I mean? And so, right, uh, aggressive guy. Man. Yeah, I'm not going to tell God what he can't do. Right, right. And, but, uh, but I would not tell somebody. No, I wouldn't tell somebody that they can. But I wouldn't tell somebody, hey, based on the thief on the cross, go ahead and live your life any way you want to. Right. Because when you get that moment at the end, you can. Somebody will come baptized, you know what I mean? I wouldn't tell anybody that, you know what I mean? Well, of course, the thief on the cross is, is not the only example we have where Jesus unilaterally basically forgave someone of their sins yeah. and yet there was already a well-established God-given order in place of how sins were taken care of go up to the temple make the sacrifices yeah. but he didn't mention anything about that to the man let down through the ceiling who was paralyzed when right. he said son your sins are forgiven you he's exercising his uh, you know uh, supreme authority as the king of the universe to do that then uh, the same thing with John chapter 8, which I also believe belongs to be in John, maybe just not in John 8, might go somewhere else in John, but some of the early manuscripts don't have it there where he tells the woman taken in the very act of adultery that neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. So, but he's, he's exercising his power. But at, at the same time, he was exercising his power when he gave the Great Commission. And he says the ordinary order for this to happen is this, go preach it, when they believe it, when they repent, when they're baptized, their sins are forgiven, they become part of my kingdom, and I'm their king. That's, that's the standard ordinary way it happens. Now that doesn't exclude him from making, ex making exceptions anytime he wants. And I'm not going to argue with him when he does. We just don't know when those other times are. We've had three divinely inspired e examples of it. We don't know about any others. Yes, Stephen? Yeah, because yeah, I've... I, I, oh, this must be the day to get the instructor off the main lesson. Hey, this. Hey, <laughs> hey, man, I'm just following suit. Though. Anyways, <laughs> no, I was just, uh, I guess the way I'd always heard it is, is that the, like the thief on the cross and the other people that were given the uh, sins are forgiven, mm -hmm. they were still technically under the old covenant and the authority from Jesus hadn't been, like the new covenant, the way that was supposed to go down, hadn't mm -hmm. been give, given right. to them. And so, and that, that kind of makes a lot of sense because why would Jesus usually, and God the Father doesn't usually go against yeah. his, own, his own narrative. So would, would that kind of be on par like the thief on the cross? And they showed faith in God in some way. And, God, and know, a desire to be right with him. Yeah. But they were not in a position to do anything else other than just to say so. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would say most of the people in the Old Testament didn't yeah. have any other way for yeah. God to be gracious to him. Maybe. Law and everyone yeah. always failed it. Right. So they had to, so I mean, God's been graceful the whole, the whole sure. time. Sure. Yeah. He's not this God of vengeance and, and uh, extreme justice. He has always been the God of grace and mercy. Yeah. You know, it makes me think, bro, when you say that about uh, uh, in Hebrews when it says, um, it's always been by faith. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. Moses, all of them, uh, mm -hmm. he says in Romans, he says, a righteous apart from the law. You know what I mean? Which is by faith. And right. even though when you talk about Romans, with Jesus now being present, 
like faith is here now present walking among us mm -hmm. and then those who obviously received the message were baptized right but then you have that dynamic of those who are in the old testament and it's always been by faith mm -hmm. like being righteous before god has never been about what you do on your yep. own basis right yep. and so maybe that thief you know obviously he did put his faith mm -hmm. in regards to his salvation and being right before god and he confessed because right. he knew he was a criminal. Like, I'm, I'm getting what I deserve. Right. When you come into your kingdom, right, don't forget about it. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, I've always heard it, like, with that example with the thief on the cross, uh, I've always heard it's hard to be baptized into his death that he's not dead yet. Yeah. So, that's, that's just like, that's just a simple way sure. that it was always explained to me. So. I'll talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to the sacraments. So the Roman Western Church settled on seven, and that was sort of formalized. It had already been practiced for hundreds of years, frankly. But there had been nothing officially issued by the church leadership about that until this uh, Council of Florence in 1445 when they uh, finally dismissed. And, but then it was another hundred years at the Council of Trent when they finally started codifying in detail how this should be carried out. Again, they were trying to solve a problem that identified for the whole church, this is what we considered the sacraments, but it was another hundred years before they got around to saying, here's what you can and can't do, because there had been a hundred years of people trying to sort out the problems and answer the questions and figure out how you do or don't do these various things. Uh, that the church has now put its approval on. And so then at the Council of Trent in 1545, they actually issued a whole set of, basically, rules and regulations on how you do it for these, these seven sacraments. And that's been pretty much the practice of the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church since. Now, the Orthodox and Eastern churches uh, mostly agree with the Roman Church about the seven sacraments, but say it's not limited to just seven, that there are many other ways that God dispenses His grace to His people as well. And so they sort of refer to the seven sacraments as the greater mysteries. And that, that's, that's a word they like to use in the Orthodox Church because they tend to be more... You get mystical. Mystical, that's the right word I was looking for, thanks. Uh, they're more mystical, and so they they will refer to them as the mysteries. In other words, they're, they, they're not saying we know exactly how God is dispensing His grace in each one of these things, but we know He is. And so when we look specifically at the, at the sacrament, if we want to call it that, of the communion, they don't get involved in whether the body of Christ is literally present in the bread and the wine or whether it's only... Uh, representatively there or not, they said it's a mystery. <laughs> so that's their solution. And the Eastern Church for that and many others is that uh, exactly how God does this, that's a God thing. And it's not necessarily a thing we as humans have been privileged to be uh, told. But, but they have a number of other sacraments, for example, every time they dedicate a new church building. They consider that a time when God is dispensing His grace to His people and making a new place for them to meet. When, uh, when a funeral takes place, not just the last rites while the person is still alive, but even in a funeral itself, the services that go on at a funeral, is a sacrament in the Eastern Church. And there's a number of other events that they commonly refer to as uh, sacraments among them. Now, in Protestantism in the West, and we are part of that, under that general umbrella. Uh, most Reformation and evangelical, at least, groups tend to think only in terms of the two sacraments, the two we're talking about, baptism and the communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, now then, as we think more about the Lord's Supper, we know it was instituted by Jesus the night before He was crucified. He does it while he and his disciples are gathered together, it seems to be to celebrate the Passover, though there was some that would argue about whether it was truly Passover or whether Passover was actually going to be the next night. Mm -hmm. And I 
I, I think that's probably a dead end road to go arguing about that one way or the other because we just don't have enough evidence. Some argue, well, the Jews, because uh, of how many people came to Jerusalem to celebrate it, celebrated over two nights, half of them one night, the other half the other night, and that's their solution. That sounds like a good one. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds good. Uh, others will say, well, because of the way Jews kept t time, you know, a new day began at sunset and ended at, at sunset, then it, it, that's how you explain all this. Well, okay. I get lost and confused when they start trying to explain it that way, but it sounds good. But it, it seems essentially to me that at Passover, whether the exact meal Jesus and his disciples were having met all the criteria for Passover or not, uh, I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I think it did. So I do think it was actually Passover they were celebrating, but I understand why some may see it slightly differently than that. But it was during this Passover season at the time when they would traditionally would do the things that involved the Passover, that Jesus in the midst of that says, I'm going to do something new with you. First he tells them, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've thought of this before. He said, I'm going to show you how much I love you. Not by stretching out my arms and being nailed to a cross and dying, but by taking off my outer robes and taking up a, a bowl of water and a towel and washing your feet. Isn't that pretty interesting that he said this? I'm going to show you how much I love you by washing your feet. And interestingly, there are some Protestant groups and some Eastern churches that count foot washing today as a sacrament as a result. But it was during this same period of time then with his disciples, he, he takes the cup, blesses it, dispenses it to them, then he takes the bread, blesses it, dispenses it to them. And if you, and I, I wish I could find more information on it, but down through the history of the practice of the Lord's Supper in different parts of the Christian community over 2,000 years, you find some groups that would take the cup first, some take the bread first. Find some that they take them both together. And, uh, you know, probably in most, well, I know in most of the churches I have worshipped at, preached at, and so forth. We seem to always take the bread first, then the cup, except when the poor older brother would get confused and pick up the tray first with the wine on it and then bless it first, you know. So then we did it backwards a couple of times. But, uh, but is, that really the, is that really an issue? Is that really the point? Do we have to do it in one order or the other? Uh, there doesn't seem to be the, the emphasis in the text. Luke actually has two cups involved. If you actually read his account, there was a cup, then the bread, then another cup. And, uh, but the main point seemed to be of Jesus that this practice, this supper as he called it, which as someone jokingly says today, uh, you know, taking a little tiny cup of grape juice and a piece of bread not even big enough to feed a bird, it hardly seems like a supper. But... Uh, Again, I don't think the quantity was what the emphasis was on. It was, it was a memorial that he was instituting, a time to remember. And he wanted it to be done regularly and often. For he said, as often as you do it. Now, did he specify every Sunday? No, he didn't. He didn't say every Sunday. So as someone asked me, well, Eric, wasn't it? He was asking me during the break about how do we establish not only that Christians met on Sunday, but that by extension that probably would mean the communion as well. The, the record's a little unclear in the early church, in the history of the early church, whether they did it only on Sunday. Now, yes, on Sundays, yes, they did. It's very clear in the early church records that there was Sunday observance, but not always on Sunday. But, I, I'm sorry, not, not only on Sunday sometimes. There are some records that said every time they baptized someone, they would, after the baptism, they would provide uh, the supper for that person after their baptism, whether it was Tuesday night, Saturday morning, or whatever. They, and, and that was sort of the beginning of this later emphasis in the Western church still of making sure a, a person has communion almost immediately after they get into a right relationship with God, whether it's at last rites or...
And, and adult baptism, they still do that too, by the way. And those are all issues, you know, I don't think we can solve. I think we each do that which in our own mind seems to be the best thing to do and we extend a certain amount of tolerance and understanding towards those that may think a little differently about that. But certainly this has been a continuing practice in the church from the, the first century until now. I do want to bring to your attention some controversy that came up during the Ref Reformation uh, and that is over exactly how to understand how it was the body and blood of Christ and they were responding to what had been happening in the church they all came out of which was a Catholic church the Roman Catholic Church we uh, I have in my notes here at the fourth Lateran Council the Lateran Council there were at least four councils all called letter and councils at the fourth one in 1215 that's where it was declared by that council that the that that the bread and the wine don't actually change but at an unseen level the elements are transformed into the body and blood of Christ that externally it's still bread and wine but somehow internally and they were not getting all into the physics, chemistry, biology, or whatever else would be involved in that. But they say at an at a invisible level that they actually have become the body and the blood of Christ. And this theory or this view of communion is called transubstantiation. Trans means to change. Substantiation means the substance changes. And in... In Greek, the word for substance, which appears several times in the New Testament, the word substance, but never in connection with communion. But the word substance means that which is of the essence of something, that which you cannot take away from it and it still be what it is. And, and so, for example, it says concerning Christ, who being in his very nature, Philippians chapter 2, God, the word nature there is a Greek word for substance. In his essential substance, he was God. That means you could never take that away from him. And so when he became a man, he didn't cease to be divine. Because by definition, the word used to describe his nature couldn't be taken away from him. But then that works the other way. Now he took on the very nature, same word again, of a servant. Same passage. So he also took on that which essentially made him a man. Do you know what that means? He can never not be a man either. So he is forever. He made a sacrifice even beyond just leaving heaven's glory and coming down and dying and coming us. He chose to be changed forever into someone who's both God and a man. I think that's why Paul will talk, you know, on Mars Hill in Acts chapter, what, 17, 18, 17. Acts chapter 17 will tell them at the end of his sermon before the interruption, it says that, that God will judge us by that man, Jesus. <laughs> because today, the one sitting on the throne at the right hand of God is a man. He's also God, but he's also a man. And he always will be. And when he comes back, Brings an end to everything here. The judgment takes place. All that's behind us. Eternity begins and we're there with Him. What does He do? He takes His place with us, it says, as the firstborn among many of His brothers. He chose to forever have His relationship changed with the Father in order to save us. But anyway, that's where the word... <laughs> You don't even have to get me off track. I'll do that all by myself. Uh, that's, that's the word substance. The English word is substance. The uh, Greek word that that comes from means that which is of the essence of something and cannot be taken away from it. And so transubstantiation, when it's talking about the Lord's Supper, is talking about how somehow the, the bread and the wine is transformed in some invisible way to be actually the, the, the flesh and the blood of Christ. That's called 
substantiation. Yes, sir. This is kind of deep. Uh, but, uh, obviously, you can make anything a salvation issue. Let us do this. Yes. But on the surface, just as it is, if I believe it, do, the Lord's Supper is trans transubstantiated. Transubstantiation. I need yep. to Yeah. Um, transubstantiation. So if that's what if that's what I believe, versus it, it's in remembrance of, which mm -hmm. is what we read in the text. Right. Um, is that considered? Do you think that's considered adding something to the word, or 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 is, is that something that it's like as long as it's not, not as long as it's not like well if you don't believe in transubstantiation then you're going to hell mm -hmm. or vice versa. Right. Um, to, like I said, we can take it there. But I mean, if it's like, hey, this is what you know, and I mean, I don't think there's a problem. But but do you do you think that um, do you do you find anything wrong scripturally with transubstantiation? That I think that's okay. a better way to ask. Okay. Question. Well, there, of course, there's there's three other views uh, about the communion, which we still have to talk about. But mm -hmm. to yeah. go ahead and answer your question, here's how I tend to approach that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe when you take the do you believe what Jesus said when you take the bread? Do you believe what he said, this is my body? Do you believe that? Yes. Do you, do you practice what he said to practice when you take that bread and do it in remembrance of him? Yes. Then it's not a salvation issue as long as you answer those two questions. Okay. Beyond that, I think it's just a matter, you know, exactly how it's the body of Christ. And just how far you even carry the remembrance part of it, if, right. according to what the scriptures say, that seems to be the two issues. Do we understand that it's his body in some sense, right. when it doesn't even specify exactly how, right. and that we're doing it in remembrance of him, yeah. even though somebody might do it with a great ornate service with guys with robes on and people line up in long lines one by one, and others may do it very simply like we do it here. The whole one cup yeah. Yeah, or even those with just one cup, even within the re restoration movement. Uh, I, I don't think any of that is a salvation issue. Uh, I think what is more pertinent is exactly what the text says, and do we accept that and practice that? I think that's the, the, the fundamental part, and that, that's where I stay with that. Co Thank you. Cooper. I did a little study after we were went through Martin Luther in... in Calvin and some of their mm -hmm. thoughts on the, on this, right. and the effect of my thinking because his emphasis was on what Jesus said: "This is my body." Right. Went, okay, that's a good argument. I mean, he said that. Mm -hmm. Then I did, then I looked up like, okay, everywhere in the New Testament it says represents or symbols or likened to nowhere in reference, almost nowhere at all. Yeah. But nowhere in reference to. Communion. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's in a real sense, in some way, yeah. it's his, it's his body. Now that's a good thing to point out. We'll often say, well, it symbolizes. Yet that word's never used in the New Testament yeah. to describe mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That that came along later. So let's look at these other three views. There's transubstantiation, which was the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Uh, Luther struggled with that. And yet he felt like there were, that, that that had to be somehow close to it. So he, he had a view that somehow the body and blood of Christ was present with it. And so that, that point of view, which is held to quite a, with quite a few people today, is called consubstantiation. Con meaning with. Uh, consubstantiation with, with the substance. It, it didn't change the substance, but it's there with the substance. So you've got transubstantiation, consubstantiation. And a third view is what's called the symbolic view, which is the one you're referring to. And that's probably the one we hear most often in the restoration movement, is that these elements represent, and I, I'm not opposed to using that word, or even symbolize. I'm not opposed to using that word, but I do acknowledge that neither of those words are actually used in the New Testament to describe the communion. And But that view is called the symbolic view. So you've got transubstantiation, consubstantiation, symbolic view. And then there was a view that Calvin took. 
So we got these four guys that, uh, three guys that show up to have a meeting to find out if they could all be united in the Reformation, Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, and they held three different views about the communion. And all three of those views were different than the church they all came out of, the Catholic Church, which was a fourth view. Swing, uh, Calvin's view was that uh, the Holy Spirit was present in some sense in the bread and in the wine. And in that sense, that was Christ present. That He was present in these uh, tokens and these... Uh, and this piece of bread and this uh, bit of wine that he was, the Holy Spirit was present in them and that was Christ through the Spirit present in them. And that's referred to as the dynamic view because from the old Greek word dynamism, power, dynamo. And so the power of the Spirit is in the bread and the wine. Why am I making such a big deal about this? Because Chris, Christianity still is represented by all four of these different views. That's number one. Number two, this is going to be on your final. Okay, so if you want to know where to find this when you're trying to answer these questions on final, here they are in your notes. Could you... Oh, sorry, could you clarify that? No, I'm just joking. No, um, you know, I actually recently, this has to do with the sacraments. I recently got in a debate with on this Catholic... Uh, I think it's Paul Jacobs debating the faith on Facebook. There was this Catholic talking about transubstantiation, and then a couple of Lutherans got in there, and they're mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, it's a little literal body and blood." And all I asked, and this is, and this is where I take my view from the symbolic approach. You know, because we know that Jesus spoke in a lot of parables. We know that he used a lot of figurative languages and allegories. Mm -hmm. He used a lot of real things too, but he also used a lot of figurative language. So when he's sitting there with his disciples, he's like, take this, this is my flesh, eat of it, and this is my blood. If we take everything literally, is Jesus literally giving out his literal body? And his, I can't imagine Jesus just being mm -hmm. like, look, dude, here's some of my blood, homie. I'm going to give you some of this, and here's some of my flesh. No, that's not what Jesus was saying. He was, he was using it symbolically. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know how you could come up with... Well, it's a literal, it's literal. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? I mean, unless you think that Jesus and his homies were cannibals, you have to take <laughs> some sort of other view. Yeah, I, I don't mean, it's just, it's common sense well, to me, honestly. Well, it's just common sense. I, he hit that in John, John 6, uh, 53 through 66. You know, who can accept this hard teaching? Boy, eat my flesh. Who can, mm -hmm. you know, he was like, because they, they, they really, those people who were following him, uh, you know, obviously disciples turned mm -hmm. away, right? And then right. Still following. Yeah, I think it's something each one of us need to think about carefully and keep thinking of throughout your entire Christian walk and your experience all of your life. Uh, I don't personally feel like, and that was my earlier answer to Sean, that uh, which one of these four views you take or if there's some other one out there, mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned, beyond these four. These are the four most common. Uh, as long as you're, you're still saying, okay, uh, in, some, in some real way, symbolically or otherwise, this is really His body and blood, and, and in doing this, I really am remembering that He gave His body and shed His blood for me. Uh, that seemed to be the essence of what it was all about. And so, um, I, I mean, I've been studying this for, you know, for a long time. When I took church history in college, my, my actually term paper was on the celebration of the Lord's Supper in the first 300 years of the church. That's what I wrote on. And I'm, I'm still as unclear today on what I actually think about that as I was then when I wrote it. So, uh, because there are just some things it seems like, and this is one of them, that the Lord just hadn't told us quite as much as we have liked for Him to have told us on this subject, or hadn't revealed quite as much as we would like. But I do want to just and I, Brad, I know you had your hand no, up, so I, go ahead. I'm good, thank you. Okay. I was going to say, Jesus also said, do this in remembrance of him. Yes. So it didn't, it, by implication, it be that he wasn't physically there at the mm -hmm. time. And then we even think about Paul telling the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 that when you do this in an unworthy manner, you're not discerning the body and the blood of Christ. Mm 
And yeah, the, the other thing was he, he continues on, you know, drinking this fruit of the vine. Uh -huh. He didn't say drinking this blood. Yeah. So, uh, and that, you know, in the 10 minutes or so I've got left here, that so much more to, we could study about this, but a couple of other things to talk about besides just the different ways people celebrate it is even the, the emblems, is, that's another word we use in regard to this, that's part of the symbol uh, theology to talk about emblems, is it exactly what people use. We know the Corinthians were celebrating the communion along with an evening meal they were having together, a full-on supper. And Paul basically says, you know, y'all don't seem to be able to separate out the, you know, he wasn't actually condemning them eating together, but I think he was, it seems to me he was saying because y'all can't seem to focus on the most important thing here, you need to dispense with that other so you can focus on what, this is really supposed to be all about. But then beyond that is, you know, we very much an emphasis on uh, uh, unleavened bread we use here. And yet, there's not a terribly long tradition, I have to tell you, in Christianity of using unleavened bread for the communion. I'm not saying that's wrong to use it, or that, that we mu nor am I saying we must use it, honestly. I prefer to use it because I think it symbolizes more completely uh, what, you know, because the old Jewish thinking, and we're trying to get away from that, but at the same time the old Jewish thinking was that, you know, uh, yeast and, and uh, things like that represented corruption. And his, his body was uncorrupted. And so I... And just in my personal preference, and that's all it is, I think the unleavened bread does a better job of symbolizing that, but I have had the communion with regular uh, other kinds of bread. The same is true of the cup. Uh, in general, it was not until, at least from what I've read, it wasn't until the early 1800s in Christian history, I'm not saying about what happened in the New Testament, but in Christian history, in general, it was not to the 1800s that churches started saying, well, maybe we should be using unfermented wine instead of regular wine. And so again, I've, I've, I've celebrated the supper, and Lord forgive me if I was wrong, using uh, bread that had risen and wine. But... In it, I still discern the body and blood of Christ, and I did it because I wanted to remember what He did till He comes again. So hopefully He'll forgive me for the rest of it if that wasn't right. right. But again, I'm just telling you what's happening in history. I'm not telling you what I think the Scriptures, what we should be doing or whatever. We sh we'll have to struggle with that separately. But most of Christian history does not show, uh, I don't think, and there will be some brothers who disagree with me. I could even name a couple that have written books on the subject. Will argue that no, it has to be unfermented wine and it must be, uh, you know, unleavened bread. And I respect their point of view and I would never, you know, expect them if they came to a congregation where I was at and we were doing something different, I wouldn't expect them to, part to partake if they, if they felt that violated their conscience. But still. You taste unleavened bread? I take the unleavened bread, but I have had it leavened. Oh, I understand. You taste it. Yeah. It's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> of course, there's also a lot of people point out that uh, if you've ever had a good tortilla, that's also unleavened bread, you know. And in many places, that's what they use actually for communion. They don't use these little dried out crackers like we do around here. Uh, and, and they, uh, you know, they... the yeah. No, I, I, I think it meets the criteria, but I'm just suggesting it might not be the only way to meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. Yes, had that too. But anyway, here's two very vital things that we all practice regularly and will continue to be a part of our ministries is uh, both baptism and communion. And uh, on the one hand, we don't need to con try to confuse our people by uh, saying there's all sorts of other ways that the Christian community has celebrated this over the years. And yet at the same time, I think we need to have a little tolerance and forbearing towards those who might think a little differently about some parts of it than us.
let's try to keep our focus on what is the essentials in, in these things. And um, Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. What, what are we to think? Because there, cause there are a lot of churches now within the 21st century, and there a lot of them are denominational, and even a lot of non-denominational churches. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them do not practice what we call sacrament of communion. Right. Very, very seldom. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm like, what, what are we to think about that? Because I, the only reason why I didn't practice it for like almost years because I could not yeah. practice it. Right. right, but I knew people that just I know people that don't. Yeah, and that's an interesting observation. There are some of these mega churches and others that very seldom, if ever, even have communion now, yep. wow. and yet others are doing it regularly. Yeah, uh, I'm familiar with a, a independent, non-denominational community type church that practices communion every Sunday here in Lubbock. Yeah, yeah, and uh, few, it's so just, it's just weird. I mean, yeah. I, don't know, I just thought that was interesting. I didn't get. I, I never was a part of a church that actively did communion mm -hmm. every Sunday until. I'm even aware of a, a congregation, Church of Christ, that they they conduct two services like Sunset does here because of their size, and one they consider a little more progressive, one very traditional. And so the traditional one, when they have communion, they pass out the trays just like we do here. I stayed for the other, more a little bit more progressive service, and even after I got past the guitar and the and so forth up on the stage. When it came time for the communion, they practiced it, still had the same bread and the same wine, but instead of it being passed out among the people, we were, people were invited to go up to the front. They had several tables up front, and people gathered around the tables up front. And with the family. And, hmm? so with, the family. with their families and with uh, others that were part of the body there, and, and they didn't take them separately. You took both the bread and the wine at the same time. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I, I'm not sure how many seekers that were there knew what in the world was going on. Either way, you know. Yeah, I don't. But, uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, no, no, no. It's, 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 I mean, some things that we think are seeker friendly may not may not actually be. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think their purpose was to try to make it connect better with a younger oh, yeah, yeah. group. I was, I was, that was a joke. I realize that. Okay. Well, okay, uh, Edmund. I understand that. I was just going to share. I've gone to a, a Church of Christ in Houston that had, excuse my expression, but they had the best guitar, drum, section, music. Yeah. And uh, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, actually it was the uh, first calling Church of Christ. It was a mega church. They, I was Amazed that they do like sixty-seven thousand dollars a week in collections and, and their offerings, and it was just absolutely nothing that I saw here. That, that was, mm -hmm. was surprised me. That's all. Okay. Now Monday we have one more class. It, it, will, it will be an abbreviated one. In other words, I won't go the entire time. Uh, that's when you'll get your final. Uh, I've asked Coop, Cooper to help some. We're going to be looking at worship. In, in the history of the church. Obviously we can't cover that subject well, but we're just going to touch some highlights of that during the early part of that class period, and Cooper's going to help me out with a little bit of that. Uh, and then you'll get your final, and then I'll see you again next Thursday when you turn it back in along with everything else that's due. Next Thursday, what? Sorry, what? Uh, from 9 to 12. 9 to 12. You can bring it in any time from 9 to 12, and I'll be here if that's where the classroom they want us to use. and. And uh, I'll be here, probably listen to a podcast or something, waiting for anybody to show up. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Richard, thank you, Richard.